Okay, you wanted to tell a story about my mom? Oh, yes. Uh, I was designated as the person to dress Steffi on her wedding day. One, one thing. Is there any way we could get... Is that a TV on or something? Oh, you want... Oh, yeah, the background noise. Thank you. Sorry. You can't compete with Dr. Oz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Start again. If you... Start again? Yeah. Yeah, I was the one designated to dress Steffi on her wedding day. So we went into the bridal room and I started to dress her. But it took quite a while and the, you know, the photographer was champing at the bit. He wanted to take the photographs and uh, <clears throat> the uh, procession was about to start. And what happened was that uh, the, a train on the gown was very intricate. And it took me a while longer to fix it because she didn't want the trail to be, you know, on the pictures or whatever. You know, what Steffi wants, Steffi gets. And uh, it took, I'd say, about a good hour and a half to dress her. She's all finished. She looked absolutely beautiful and she turns around to me and says and Selma I'm going to take a shower and wash my hair now and I said to myself this girl doesn't know how close she came to not being a bride that day <laughs> what were you thinking when she told you she was going to take a shower I was going to kill her but she did she, I had to undress her, redo the train, or rather undo the train, and uh, she took her shower and washed her hair. And remember, that was before we had hair dryers. So she had wet hair and I had to dress her all over again. But she turned out to be such a beautiful bride. And I love her dearly. And I love Ron also. Now talk to them like you're talking to them, you know, like, like that's them right there. Steffi and Ron, I wish you the best of everything. Long life, plenty of happiness from your children, which I know you're getting now, but more so. And Uncle Arthur and I are, are very happy to be here with you and to celebrate your 50th anniversary. God bless both of you. What are the memories do you have um, about their wedding itself or the ceremony? Not too much because what happened was that I was the last to come into the chapel because of, you know, dressing her again and getting the room cleaned up and uh, I was sitting more or less in the back so I'm not in any of the pictures on the wedding. Well uh, the wedding was held at the Huntington townhouse which in those days uh, was uh, considered way out on the island and uh, I remember it was quite a hot day and uh, I remember everybody was yelling for Steffi to get ready and start to walk down the steps. The dressing room was upstairs. There was a winding staircase. And for her to come down and uh, be present at the ceremonies. <laughs> and we finally got her to come down. And I believe she floated down. She looked gorgeous. And uh, that's my memories of the wedding. And I remember Goldie and Eddie, proud as anything as the parents. And mom and pop. And pop and Ron's parents there. And uh, well, it goes back a little further, quite a bit further. And the day that I was coming back from school, I was 15 years old. And we lived in the South Bronx, in the Hunts Point area, on a street named Barreto Street. 
and uh, I was walking towards our apartment in this uh, tenement, this, uh, yeah, it was a tenement, and a Mrs. Breitbart, I don't think any relation to Andrew Breitbart, but Mrs. Breitbart, Breit Mrs. Breitbart was sitting at the window with a pillow under her hands on the ground floor of the building, and she says, Arthur, you're an uncle. <laughs> That's when Steffi was born. Really? And uh, I could remember that uh, my brother, your grandfather, uh, your father, and um, the rest of the gang, they had a softball team called the Mactees that played in the schoolyard. So they got together, and the same company that made their team jackets uh, made up a bathrobe for a, an infant, and on the back it said, Kid Steffi. <laughs> and uh, it was a happy, happy time. Where were you living then? Uh, on Braille Street. Where? Uh, Barretto, B-A-R-R-E-T-T-O. That is in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx, corner of Southern Boulevard. We had a trolley running on a surface, a subway running underneath the trolley. Did you take my mom out at all when she was a little girl? Did you play with her? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, we babysat for her yeah. when Goldie wanted to play canasta. Yeah. So uh, the two of us babysat. Right. What would you do with her? What was oh, she, like? she was in the crib uh, going to sleep, and she did go to sleep. And uh, we was, what were we doing that night? <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I could remember vividly, I think she was uh, two or three years old, and somehow... Uh, she was on the sidewalk and she fell and it was one of the few times I saw my father cry. Her grandfather was with her and apparently she fell when she was on, in his charge. And he was so emotionally shook up because she scraped her face a little bit. And, uh, but she recovered nicely. And uh, I... Uh, Two years later, I went into the Marine Corps, and I was away for four years. And at that time, uh, Steffi's sister, Marsha, was born. And they had moved from Barreto Street to Longfellow Avenue. And when I came back from the Marine Corps, that's where I came to. And I remember watching her grow up. And my folks moved to Rockaway, and uh, uh, Steph Steffi, Marsha, and the family also moved to Rockaway. What was my mom like as a little girl, personality-wise? Personality, she was very smart, very intelligent. Uh, you know, we veered away from a more or less an intimate contact because I had my group of friends and I was 15 years older than her and uh, the contact wasn't great until I imagine the marriage or a little before the marriage and there was one uh, incident where Ron's parents was supposed to come for an engagement dinner. And uh, this was in Rockaway. And my mother prepared. And uh, uh, Ron's father and mother had a candy store or a stationery store, I believe, out in the island in uh, Smithtown or around that area, Farmingdale, someplace. And uh, he worked long hours, uh, Ron's father. And uh, my mother prepared. We were all in attendance there. And we're waiting for Ron's father and mother to show up. 
Then I imagine they had a store to close and stuff like that. May I say something? Uh, you normally do. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Uncle Harold and I were very hungry. But Steffi would not allow anyone to eat anything until Ron arrived with his parents. So there was a lot of liquor and Harold and I decided, well, if we can't eat, we'll drink. And we became stoned, the two of us. So when Ron's parents arrived, we were put in the, at the children's table. We were not allowed to be near the adults. <laughs> Go on, dear. And uh, they finally arrived, Ron and his mother and father, and we sat down to eat. And, uh, you know, the weight and, uh, I guess, the warmness and the liquor and the wine made everyone <laughs> quite sleepy. So I think a few of us dozed off, <laughs> including Ron's father, your grandfather. And uh, <laughs> that was it. And I he knew fell it. asleep throughout the whole meal. And uh, it was very, very funny. We didn't make any things somber out of it, anything serious out of it, because first of all, uh, my, my family, Eddie, Steffi's father, Goldie, all of us were upbeat, I guess by inheritance or by genetics or the, by the fact that we had pleasing people all around us, that we made it into a uh, funny incident rather than anything that's tragic. And uh, those are some of the good memories we have. And uh, when Steffi and Marsha shared the apartment with us in Rockaway, they hated me that summer because I made them clean up. <laughs> and we had an incident whereby cousin Murray DeMast came to visit my in-laws. Uh, he had never seen the house, and my father-in-law called up because they were downstairs and we were upstairs, and he said, Murray DeMast is coming, clean up. So the three of us, Marsha, Steffi, and I, uh, started cleaning up, but the only way to really clean up their mess, and at that time, <coughs> Cindy was a little girl, uh, we threw everything into a closet, the bicycle, everything. And my father-in-law comes up to the apartment with Murray, shows him the apartment, and then he wanted to show him his big, beautiful closet. But I knew if he opened up the door, everything would come tumbling out. So I stood in front of the door, eagle style, so he couldn't get in. And he says, what's the matter with you, Selma? I said, nothing, you know, uh, I I'm just standing here. And he says, get out of the way. <laughs> and I kept saying, no, <laughs> until finally he and Murray left. And then I opened up the closet, and as I said, everything came tumbling the, out. The bedding and the... <laughs> and Steffi and I, at night, uh, in Rockaway, used to go for hot fudge Sundays. Arthur would watch Sydney, and Steffi and I <laughs> would treat ourselves to hot fudge Sundays. In fact, she mentioned it, uh, oh, a short while ago how much she enjoyed and I enjoyed going for those hot fudge Sundays. Just the two of you? Just the yeah. two of us. Would you talk? Do you remember? Yeah, oh, sure. We talked to each other. But they, they hated me. <laughs> <laughs> and because of, you know, my making them wash the bathroom floor <laughs> well, and clean up their room and make their beds. <laughs> well, we were they weren't used to. Yeah. We were invited out to their first home, which they bought, which was in Smithtown. And uh, we went there. Uh, Evan was, must have been about eight, seven or eight. 
Yeah. And uh, Cindy was uh, three years older. And we went out there. It was a very nice small house, a tract house that they normally built out in the island. And uh, we spent some time in the backyard. There was a fence separating her house and the neighbor's house. And uh, apparently the neighbor had a dog. And there was some uh, tossing ball playing in the backyard, and the ball went over the fence into the neighbor's yard. Uh, Evan decided to climb the fence to get the ball, which he did. We heard the door. We couldn't see anything because it was a solid fence. Uh, we heard the dog barking, and all of a sudden there was a scrambling, and Evan just came hurtling over that fence, <laughs> which I think was about six foot high. Because I couldn't see over it. How old was Evan back then? About, about eight, uh, seven or we eight. We saw him flying over the fence. <laughs> so, we'll have to go look behind the fence fast. We have so, Eddie, that's uh, Steffi's father, remarked that he would make a good Olympic hurdler the way he came <laughs> over that fence. I just saw him move so fast. Right. Did the dog bite him? No. Uh, apparently not. But he was scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then they moved out to Fort Salonga or Sunken Meadows, or we called it Alashvats Yur. Now, translation of the Yiddish Alashvats Yur means all the dark years. That's how far away it was. <laughs> you would have to travel <laughs> ad infinitum out into the boondocks to get there. And our first few trips were long, and, uh, but the house was beautiful, I remember, and I loved Ron taking me around. And in fact, at one time I went out there and we were trying to work out a better ventilation system for the basement, I remember that. And uh, then uh, the kids were born, Andrew, Dole, and Stefan. And uh, we enjoyed them. We did various occasions, uh, family circle meetings, stuff like that. And Do you remember when you first met my father? Uh, that was at the engagement party, I believe, Selma. No, it was on a Saturday, and Steffi came with Ron. It was also in Rockaway, right? Yeah, that was in Rockaway. He came with, she came with Ron, and uh, oh, he looked like a real dork. Very short hair, hardly any sideburns, and uh, Steffi introduced him to us, and... Uh, I guess that was it, you know. We didn't stay too long in the apartment because I'm sure, you know, at the time that Steffi wanted to say something or Ron wanted to speak to my in-laws. But the funny part, when uh, Noel was born and then there was the bris. And after the bris, my father-in-law sat down next to me and said, what kind of a name is Noel? <laughs> I said, it's a name. He says, but well, what kind of name is Noel? Are we saying this again? Shire by no, your my, yeah. my, my father. <laughs> Did he think it was like a Goyim name? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. I mean, no, Noel. Well, oh, well, yeah. He well, said, well, so what kind of a name is that? So was, so was Steffi. Steffi was an odd name at that time. Isn't that kind of a German name, Steffi? Well, it's, it's Ste short Stephanie. for Stephanie. And Stefan is, I see that in Germany when I was there. Yeah, uh, oh, Stefan. Really? Yeah. Stefan's cookies with my spelling. Yeah. Oh, really? P-H. Yeah. With an F. With an F. F, yeah. Stefan. That's how they spell it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, so the first time you met my father, was, it, was he friendly? Uh, like a dog. Quiet? Yes. Shy? I think so. It was, was quiet, shy. yes. Was he the first rocket scientist you ever met? Yes, he was. 
except for me, she called me a space cadet. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so would you talk to my father about his work a lot, uh, Uncle Arthur? Uh, I didn't talk a lot. I assumed that a lot of his uh, work was done uh, more or less hush-hush secrecy, so I didn't pump the guy. If uh, Ron wanted to elucidate, wanted to say something, uh, then I would pick up on it. But I didn't uh, start the conversation, a technical conversation. Oh, and then there was a time where uh, we took Steffi, Ron, and you Ste uh, Steffi, Ron, you, Stefan, and a girlfriend of yours at the time, uh, up to the office where I worked on the 35th floor, overlooking uh, the... Uh, for the fireworks? For the f fireworks. I Do you yes. remember that? I mean, you remembered it better yeah. than me, but now I actually remember now, it. Now, exactly. uh, this occasion... Great uh, view. Right. <laughs> it was on the 35th fifth floor of a building overlooking New York Harbor on Rector Street, 19 Rector Street. <coughs> and this was for the uh, bicentennial of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Statue of Liberty. No, I, that was... I the, know the year because I remember when I was dating this No, person. no, no. This was the... It had to be like 1980. Five, Something four, like that. 1987. 1987. Um, I'm trying to remember. They had closed off all of Lower Manhattan from Canal Street down to vehicular traffic. Right. And there was a big weekend party uh, where. Um, they had a celebration, I believe it was the Bicentennial. Uh, that was the time they brought the, um, uh, the, the bill, no, the Bill of Rights. Yeah, oh, Steffi was the Bill oh, of Rights. Uh, we went to, uh, where did we go? With federal the house, the federal bill Hall, of Federal Hall down on Wall Street. Uh, it was Steffi, uh, Ron, and Arthur you and Ron, I. Ron, you know, and me. And we, you want me to tell it? Anyway. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we went in there because it was uh, a open for the traffic, which was all pedestrian because no cars were allowed. And they have, you know, the uh, relics or, uh, of the start of our country there in Federal Hall. And all of a sudden, some men with a bulky object between them. And they all had guns. And they had this object on a dolly, and they were walking it to the back of the Federal Hall. So Steffi decided she wanted to walk over and find out what they were doing. <laughs> and as she's walking over, one of the guys said, don't you dare come any closer, man. <laughs> And I think his hand was going towards the gun, because they had the Bill of Rights there, one of the few copies, and they brought it in from Washington from the archives to show during this holiday. <laughs> that, that's the first time. She the, stopped dead. <laughs> that's the first and last time your wife made a move. For your, <laughs> Your mom, mom right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, anyway, you were up there with your mother and father, and uh, we watched the fireworks, and we were so high up that the fireworks, which you normally, from a street level, would have to look up to, exploded right in the windows of where we were at. We couldn't go out on a terrace because they would, the uh, Secret Service would not allow us because somebody can bring up a weapon and try to take out the dignitaries. What, did, what were you doing for that company? What, what, what company was it that you were working for? Uh, for uh, a Taroko uh, Enterprises. I worked for them for 21 years. I was the office manager. 
What kind of company was it? Oh, uh, import export. What would they import export? Artwork? Uh, oh no, <laughs> no artwork. This was uh, scrap, uh, computer scrap that they were exporting. And uh, there were several uh, companies within the company, uh, so, you know, satellite companies, and they imported from uh, the Far East uh, several products. One company had bicycles uh, <coughs> manufactured and they imported them. Another one had Asian food uh, imported. Uh, another company had uh, uh, a computer division where they uh, worked for Baden Hospital and uh, they recorded all the records on computers. But in those days, they were the very large disks. And as I said, I didn't worked they, for them for 21 didn't years. Didn't they try uh, uh, importing rugs and stuff? Well, th th that was more or less uh, for the personnel, the rugs. Uh -huh. you guys You're standing on a rug that was, came from one of the first rugs that came out of China when they started to become an industrialized nation. This was one of the first products that they right, could right. sell that was indigenous to the natives. Uh, Can I ask you guys about a very particular day? I don't know if you remember it, but you may. Uh, the day Andy was born. Actually, I think oh, I yes, that was paper. on JFK, was shot. Yeah. I, we visited Steffi the following day, but we didn't even talk about it because, you know, her happiness and, you know, we didn't want to put a damper on it. Uh, she was so happy when Andy was born, and we were happy too, but it was, you know, with him yeah. being killed. It, it, we weren't as happy as we could have been. Who was this? Who was this? JFK. Right. On the 23rd of November. Yeah. Uh, 22nd, 23rd, yeah, yeah, of November. Yeah, I remember that, yes. Was it shocking? Oh. Definitely. What happened was I was, you know, it was on Friday. And I was watching, no, that was the time that uh, Evan was arrested. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got to get into that at some point. <laughs> the heck was he arrested for? Oh, for demonstrating for uh, Israel. Uh, what happened was that uh, <clears throat> I think I was washing the kitchen floor. He was 13 at the time, right? No, uh, younger than that. Well, anyway, uh, Arthur called, and he says, are you listening to the news? I said, no, you know, I'm, I'm busy. He says, JFK was, was shot. Well, the first thing I did was I left the floor as it was, and I went for my children in the school. I didn't want them to be without, you know, one of their parents to console them. And I went for Cindy and Evan, they were in the same school. And I took them home and they were watching TV the whole time. Did you have to explain to them what happened? Or? Oh, definitely, definitely. And we watched the funeral, you know. And I watched few days later. Uh, Oswald being shot. I was yeah. in the, the living room watching the TV when he was coming <laughs> through and Ruby came out and shot, shot him. him in a corridor. And we you were, were shaving at the time, and I started to yell for you to come out and watch. Right. Was that shocking also? Oh. Oh, yeah. Couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And it took me a, a long time to get over President Kennedy's killing. Yeah. I admired him. I liked him. I voted for him. And... Uh, this maniac just killed him. Yeah. What about you, Uncle Arthur? Where were you when you first uh, heard it? Uh, that was Kennedy's being Kennedy being shot. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, first thing, I, wa uh, I was down in our shop, which was in Long Island City, and uh, at that time I was a uh, air conditioning refrigeration mechanic, and uh, we had our shop, which was our base, more or less, uh, unless we had to do service elsewhere in the city. And we had the radio in the shop on, uh, no TV at the time. And the bulletin came across. I had the garage doors open, so the bulletin came across and I heard it distinctly that uh, President Kennedy had been shot. He'd been run, uh, he'd been uh, taken to Parkland General Hospital in Dallas. Uh, they didn't know his condition at the time and uh, stay tuned, naturally, for more bulletins. And uh, uh, apparently a short while later, it came to about one o'clock, uh, or the bulletin came through a little after one that the president had died at one o'clock at Parkland General Hospital. How did you feel? And I immediately uh, called up my brother, and uh, we both agreed that uh, we should head home, you know. Uh, I had called Selma up, and uh, that was a tragic, tragic, well, it, was, it extended into years afterwards, naturally with trials and investigations, and... Uh, how, did you, how did you feel when you first heard that news? Uh, Numb. Well, numb. I felt completely numb. numb. numb considering that, uh, you know, my uh, proclivity, my uh, attention has always been to a liberal side of the political spectrum. I thought he was very good for the country, and I thought he was doing an excellent job. And uh, I was sort of... Uh, just like you, everything caved in when he was, and also at the moment you started to think what will happen afterwards. You know, you, you will revert into anarchy, uh, with, the com uh, with the country being such a turmoil, but then we found out, you know, a short while later that uh, the inheritance of his role being that he was dead was uh, ordained, preordained by the Constitution, and there wouldn't be any sort of infighting and stuff like that for the inheritors. So, uh, still despondent, and when we watched the funeral, it was heartbreaking. I remember sitting with Cindy and Evan in front of the TV and watching this very solemn occasion. Moving on to a happier moment. Oh, yes. <laughs> what was your first, uh, what was your reaction to man landing on the moon? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we saw him landing on the moon at a bar <laughs> in New Jersey, in New York on 3rd <laughs> Avenue. I imagine not far from where you live now, uh, on seven, uh, must have been in the 70s. Anyway, what had happened is that that weekend it was visiting day up at camp, Camp Betar, where uh, Cindy and Evan were. At that time, Cindy was a cook? I believe so. I don't remember if she was the camp cook then. Yeah, what year was that? That was uh, the landing on the moon. Oh, 69. It was 1970 something? 1969. 1969. Yeah. Uh, so at that time, the kids were in camp, right? I remember because I was one. The year. And uh, <laughs> we had driven up for the day, for visiting day, and we started to, at that time, we knew that the uh, capsule was up there, but they didn't know at that time whether the men would be able to land or whatever. We had the car radio tuned, and we were coming from uh, the Catskills up around uh, Neversink. Uh, 
Very heavy traffic. Very heavy traffic. And at that time, we took two people uh, that came up by bus to visit back to New York with our car. I was driving. I had the car. And we were driving in, and the announcer is saying that uh, uh, the capsule is orbiting the moon and stuff like that, or ready to orbit the moon. And uh, there'll be a blackout period where the capsule will go behind the moon and you won't have any, it's about a 15 or 16 minute period, from what I remember. And we're traveling very slowly. So I started to take some shortcuts that I knew and we ended up on Third Avenue in Manhattan, off the. Trying to get to the bar so you could see it. On no, the no, no, no. What we had were happened? Home. What happened? It was compounded by the fact that we wanted to uh, more or less get an idea of whether they landed or not, and the fact that we all had to go to the bathroom because <laughs> <laughs> we're traveling two, three hours. Okay. So we decided. Yeah, we decided, what look, we decided what we'll do is we'll go into a, 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 a space, a bar or a restaurant, get a beer or something, go to the bathroom, <laughs> and we come into this bar and everybody in there is transfixed at the TV. Was everyone in the nation, you think, watching the same thing? I, I would say so. There was nothing else to watch. There was no. nothing else to watch. And, uh, Did you think about my father at all then? That he, uh, oh, yes. We well, knew we, knew about about the, we knew about the lem, that he was working on the lem, and that's about all. I never questioned him on that because that was whatever I read. I read the New York Times, or at that time, I think the Tribune was out of business, and uh, on the radio or on TV. But uh, I didn't question your father on that. And uh, look, if he was forthcoming, I would have asked him. But anyway, we ran into the bar and uh, went into the uh, respective restrooms and came out, ordered a beer, and as we're ordering the beer, we see that one step for mankind and stuff like that. And uh, there we are drinking beer, watching him <laughs> land on the moon. How did you feel when you first saw the guy, uh, you know, walk onto the moon? Astounding. Astounding. And Selma? Oh, uh -huh. Uh, can you cut this for me? I go on to get us some water. Okay. Can you say that again about the moon? You <laughs> said you. Uh... Well, we were very proud of the fact that we knew someone, meaning Ron, who was instrumental or one of the people that were part of this momentous project. Well, you had uh, Martin Luther King assassinated, uh, Robert Kennedy assassinated, <laughs> all, the good, all the good things in life. <laughs> yeah. which, was more, uh, which was more shocking, actually, Martin Luther King being shot or, or JFK? Well, uh, I would say JFK. JFK. Because this was the President of the United States. And with Martin Luther King, we always felt leery about whether or not he would survive. Anyway, I did. I always felt he was out in public and he had many, many enemies. And uh, that's something like that. I mean, if it could happen to President Kennedy, it could happen to Martin Luther King. King Mahatma but Gandhi, I, other people uh, were all peaceful people, preached peace. And they were uh, killed, gunned down, stabbed. Where were you when you heard about Martin Luther King being shot? Do you remember? I remember where I was. I was uh, out getting uh, signatures <laughs> in my apartment building for a, uh, <clears throat> or I, I think a strike that we were going to. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, perform. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, they were trying. How did you hear about the news? Well, uh, we rang a bell. It was Sid Hoffman uh, and I uh, went through the building, you know, getting signatures. And uh, we rang one bell and the man opened the door. And before we had a chance to, you know, say why we're there, he said that Martin Luther King was killed. Yeah. Now and I we just, I remember Sid, he just leaned up against the wall and turned white. Yeah, he was a teacher, high school uh, teacher. What was your, uh, what did you My say reaction? When, when is this going to stop? Yeah. My first reaction was, other than devastation, when is the killing going to stop? Now, Selma, I was downstairs reading, which I normally like to do. And I didn't know until Selma came down with, to the house, back to the house with the information to tell me. Then I turned on the radio and uh, listened to the news reports and uh, watched the, turned the television on. What was your first reaction? What did you first feel when you heard that news? Well, I felt very bad. I felt very bad because my inclination was more of a uh, civil rights freedom that I thought all people should have. In fact, the school that I went to, the PS 52, Thomas Knowlton Junior High School, which was on Kelly Street, Avenue St. John's, and the Hunts Point section of the Bronx, was also the school to uh, General Powell, who went there 10 years after I went there. But even my class was like a, a uh, potpourri of Jewish kids, Irish kids, Puerto Rican kids, and blacks, African-Americans. So I was assimilated a, a long time before I became an adult with, with uh, people of other colors and stuff like that. And uh, I was, as I said before, I was liberally inclined and felt that everybody in this world should have the same chance as I have to make good regardless of the color of their skins. Was it more, you said, li liberals that were behind Martin Luther King, or was it? Oh, yeah, it was liberals. It was rabbis, uh, liberal rabbis, uh, liberal conservatives priests. Conservatives for Martin Luther King and what he was trying to do? Basically accomplish? not. No. Conservatives tended to be uh, Maybe some uh, Latino, Spanish, but uh, basically uh, most of the uh, people of color uh, were liberals. Because look, they wanted the same chance as anyone else, and it wasn't offered to them. They were discriminated against. And I remember uh, it started when I was young. But uh, can I digress and say, this is not about my life. It's about Steffi and Ron's. <laughs> and their life should be happy and as long as Selma and I, my life. Part of coming here, I wanted to definitely get a lot about my parents on here. But I definitely wanted to talk to you guys, too, about <laughs> some things. So I'm kind of doing both at the same yeah, time. Yeah, because I know, Don, well, you're not going to show an hour and a half, two hours yeah. worth of, of us. A lot of this footage, what we're talking about, that doesn't relate to them. Will not be I know that. I know that. Anything. But it was good talking to you but anyway. Good talking, yeah. <laughs> and I've been wanting to do this for years. Yeah. I've been procrastinating, so. Yeah. Um, are you okay talking about both my parents and then sometimes about your own lives? Or do you want me just to stick to my parents? No, you do whatever you want. Okay, all right. We um, have nothing to hide. Okay. Good. <laughs> I was the how. <laughs> you had the, the old joke, who well, you probably won't know about it. Maybe some of the older people watching this 
I used to say, Hauptmann is innocent, I'm the Lindbergh baby, <laughs> you know, so whatever. You Oh. Now, I never got to meet him because he passed away before I was born. Right. I've seen right. pictures of him and I've heard. I always thought it was my, my grandma Goldie, in my mind at least, that was the matriarch of the entire family. And I mean the entire family. No. But I heard it was, uh, it was Shia. Oh, well, he was I, a I, gentle, funny man. Fun-loving guy. Tell me more about him. He was a... A best father, I would say. Why? Well, I could remember when we were in Rockaway for the summer. We used to take a bungalow, rent a bungalow for the summer months. And I was, uh, I guess, a blonde-haired kid when I had hair and of possibly five or six or seven or eight. Uh, and my father at that time was working in the fur business. And the fur district was in New York. And they had the Long Island Railroad that would transport them to us in Rockaway for the summer. And I would wait for the trains to pull. The trains ran on grade like a regular railroad and it would stop, and the people would get off on the opposite side of the track. So all you saw of people walking was their feet, because you had the big space between the rails and the bed of the train. I would always recognize my father's walk somehow. Kid would know. And as the train pulled away and he would be able to come across the tracks, he would always have a game or a toy for us. So I was the youngest, so it would be more or less for me. My brother, who was seven and a half years older than me, had his own gang. And uh, uh, Steffi's mother, Goldie, would, was 10 years older than me. She had her own group of friends. But my father would always be there with a smile and a game. And the gentlest of men around. I, I could say my parents were ideal. Is that where you got your gentleness from, you think? I assume I think so. so. I assume there is a lot of gentleness in our family, our uh, extended family, mostly good marriages. A lot of them with people that knew each other for years and years before the marriage. I knew Selma when she was 13 and a half years old. I used to cut ribbons off her hair when she was jumping rope. She would chase me and I always got caught. <laughs> <laughs> and Is your father uh, non-judgmental? Uh, From what I know, well, you see, uh, he was basically a Yiddish-speaking person. So the communication in English was not that good. But uh, I guess he reacted to the various crises of the day, uh, same as anybody else. But at that time, you know, I was quite young. And uh, when I did get older, I used to hang around with my group of friends around the neighborhood and around her neighborhood where I met her. And uh, I was more or less Catholic in his tastes where he would let anybody do, where anybody do what they want to do as long as within certain bounds. And he was funny. Uh, I guess he was funnier uh, in Yiddish, in other words, with his friends than I couldn't really understand, you know, but... Uh, did you speak Yiddish with him, or did you speak uh, Yiddish? No, my uh, Yiddish, I understood a bit of it. Speaking was a little bit less fluent. And his English was broken, would you say? Yes. But he could mm -hmm. communicate. Oh, oh yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Of course, uh, 
uh, Goldie, Steffi's mother, was his uh, eyes and ears when it came to business. She took care of the books. For Bashaya? Yes. Yeah, okay. Goldie did. And she would send out the monthly bills for the apartments that yeah. he painted. Yeah. Oh, yeah, after the fur, after uh, leaving the furrier job because of the Depression in the late 1920s, he became a house painter. And, uh, How did he deal with your mischief? Did, when you used to get into trouble and stuff, was he patient with you? Would he discipline you? Or he no, he was oh. patient. He was patient with me. Uh, I'm mischievous to an extent where I would disappear for hours at a time. I mean, uh, uh, the anger would be there, and then uh, after he saw you, uh, his anger would subside, knowing that you're okay and stuff like that. What about getting, uh, you know, when you weren't, when you were having some problems in school, so in school and all, was that, uh, was, was he concerned about you? Uh, I guess they were concerned, but not that much. I imagine my brother and sister were concerned, because uh, I was considered a smart guy, but also uh, a loner, which I was. I like to go off on my own, explore. Uh, yeah, I used to, to me, traveling down, uh, downtown, going to a museum on a Saturday, I didn't want anybody around with me to tell me what they want to do and take me away from what I like to do. But your so, father basically trusted you, you think, so he wasn't too concerned if you got No, there. no, as long as I didn't get into any, you know, extenuating circumstances where I would end up in jail or for assault or uh, for robbery or anything. No, no, they were never concerned. My mother was very concerned because my father was away at work. I uh, mean, communication was not like they are today. You know, now I have instant texting and... Uh, they didn't have cell phones back then? Uh, no, no, they, they didn't even have... Phones. Phones, <laughs> well, more or less, but anyway. Somehow you could go back in time and give your father Show your father this cool no, new I remember. No, I remember reading joke books and reading the papers where you had Dick Tracy. He had a wristwatch and he was able to communicate with headquarters. <laughs> and we would say, that's so far out. A wristwatch that can communicate. You know, we never realized what would happen. I sort of had an idea because I was always mechanically, scientifically uh, minded. Would your father have liked this, some of this new technology? Oh, would he would he, love it. Would he think it was really interesting? He would. Yeah. He would. And what about your mom? Would she be like that? No, my what mom uh, was a good cook, good baker, loved to play poker. <laughs> and, uh, really? She was a poker player? Oh, oh she yes. a poker player. Every right? day. Oh, yeah. 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 Every afternoon. She was a good really? poker what? player, and my father was a lousy pinochle player. <laughs> I heard, is this true? I heard your father, if he was to win money off of people, he, he would give them back. back at the end of the yeah, he was, a, he was what they call a, a, go, a, a lousy winner. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't, he couldn't see himself taking money from his friends. Yeah. In fact, we lived on this uh, tenement, this uh, on Bretto Street, and in the hot weather, and what I wouldn't say naturally, I would say in those days we didn't have air conditioning. Now it's a part of requisite. If you get an apartment, you need air conditioning. <clears throat> there you'd swelter during the hot weather. Did you have a fan? We lived on the top floor. Uh, fans, you had the oscillating fans. You didn't have window fans at the time. Right. You'd open the windows and you'd try to catch as little of breeze as came through. So what he used to do, we lived on the top floor, which was the fifth floor. He used to set up a bridge table on a roof with some bridge chairs. And he would run an extension line down through our window over the edge of the roof and plug it into one of the outlets and into a lamp. And he and his friends would play pinochle out on the roof to get the little breezes that would come through from the river. Of course, from our roof, we could see the Tribro Bridge. And when the World's Fair was in 39, we could see the fireworks that happened every night 
from our roof. But anyway, uh, on hot weather, people used to sleep on a roof, sleep on their fire escapes, and uh, that was our life then. We didn't know anything different. Your father different. was pretty sociable, though? Pretty Very. Right? Very sociable? Yes. Very oh, sociable. Yes. Easy to talk to? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, if you had a problem, would you go to him and talk to him? Would he be someone you would? Uh... Uh, yeah, but uh, more or less, uh, look, uh, my problems to me weren't that deep. Yeah. Weren't that deep. Right. I mean, if I found a kitten and I brought it in the house, uh, you know, my father said, yeah. "What's the kitten doing?" And uh, my mother would say, "Arthur brought it in." When and he said, "When he got cancer, was it from the painting?" You think? Oh, Definitely. yes. First of all, the turpentine yeah. that he you know, inhaled. The kerosene, the kerosene is a carcinogenic. Yeah. Benzene carcinogenic. Yeah. He lost sight of one eye. He was blind in one eye. Before he, he lost sight of one eye, like later on in life? Or? Well, later was, on. Later on, I would say within uh, probably uh, maybe five to ten years before he died. But he couldn't see out of one eye? Yeah, right. he was blind. Did it look normal? He just couldn't see. Yes. It was normal, yeah. So he just had to use the other eye. Yeah. Could have been from the fumes and everything, but I'm pretty sure that the leukemia that he had gotten, and it was leukemia, was gotten through the carcinogenic lead, uh, benzene, yeah. kerosene, ter turpentine, all the oxalic acid that they used to strip wood. Everything was harsh. Yes, and doing it without any protective devices. Because yeah. I remember one summer, we were in Rockaway, and he said, I'm going to take Arthur in to help me paint. We were painting a house in Kew Gardens, I believe, or yeah. Rich. I believe it was Richmond Hill. And how old were you, would you say? 15, 14. Now, in those days, they didn't have latex paint. All the paint was lead-based oil paint. And when you paint a closet, you didn't have to paint it with a good mixture of paint, so you dilute it quite a bit. And he must have put a lot of Benny benzene into the mix. And he mixed the paint can, and he says, Arthur, he says, paint the closet. Now, you're in a confined area, breathing. and you're breathing, and I'm painting, and I'm starting to get such a high <laughs> from that stuff. <laughs> it was hot, I remember, because it was during the summer. That's when I was off from school. And I ended up with such a hangover <laughs> from that closet there. And I think my father saw it, so he took me out. And, you know, with my father, he was fast. A couple of brush strokes, and the closet was done. It was taking me an hour. It took him about <laughs> five minutes. He was the fast worker. And I was oh, trying. everything fast. Really? Was, everything. We lived on the street level in Queens years ago. And uh, I had asked... Shire if he would paint the children's room uh, because Arthur hated painting. He wouldn't do it. And it needed it. So he rang the bell and he said to Arthur, you know, he says, I'm here. And the next thing we knew, he climbed through the window into the children's yeah. room and was already set up to paint. <laughs> I opened the door and said, let me help you, Pop. He <laughs> said, don't, you don't have to. And the next thing I know, he's coming through the window <laughs> <laughs> with his ladder in the bucket. He's all ready to go, huh? All ready to go. Oh, he, he And was, he was fun. He was he fun. He was funny. Was he real upset when he got the cancer? Well, what had happened is that uh, uh, we found out he had... Uh, I think uh, gotten an intermittent fever, a fever that wouldn't go away. And he went to this uh, hematologist and uh, was diagnosed as leukemia. And I think he went for some treatments and somehow his kidneys were infected. What 
kind of treatments at the time? Do you know? Uh, it was probably uh, chemotherapy oh, or radi I don't know. Or, or radiology. It or was. We it was. don't know. Yeah. Did anyway, he was, uh, did he know it was pretty serious? Uh, I think he did. I think he did uh, because he had to stop work. He may have worked a short while after he was diagnosed, but after that, he had to stop work. He was in his late seventies, right? Uh, no, he died at the age of Earl 72. 72. He was 72? in, yeah. yeah, this was uh, about uh, when he was 70. And uh, he died in 67, the Six Day War. And he was 72 when he passed away? Yes. Yeah. My mother was 82. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what had happened is that uh, I guess possibly due to the leukemia or due to the treatments he developed kidney disease. Kidney failure. And kidney failure. And how we knew that, I mean, without uh, any diagnosis, was he was the most miserable creature in the world. He would say, get out of here, I don't recognize, which was way out of his persona. He was a smiley, friendly guy, yeah. always with a laugh. Always modify an argument, you know, uh, play the rabbi in a lot of cases and stuff. A nice guy. That's why I love him. And he was, he was out of context. So we went into a huddle. The doctor said, look, he says, the leukemia is there. He says, but if we operate on the kidneys and we're successful, it can give him a few months more, or at least a few months more. We went into a huddle and uh, Goldie and Eddie, uh, Goldie and Harold, my brother and sister, uh, were, I guess, so emotionally involved that they couldn't make up their minds whether to permit the operation or not. And I told them, let's give Pop a few more years. I don't like him this way, and I don't want him dead. So we gave permission for the doctors to operate. Sure enough, he was back to his former self. Did he know what the... Uh Outcome would be? Did he know that he could have the operation and maybe live longer or not have uh, he it? Was in, he was out of it. He was uh, so suffering really from uremic yeah. poisoning, you know, yeah. the yeah. kidney failure. Okay, so he had the operation. He had the operation and he was granted a number of months afterwards. Of decent health. Yeah, he died in June, I believe, of 67. Yeah. Right. The Six Day War. In fact, a few days before he had asked me how were they doing in Israel, you know? Did he know he was dying when... Uh, I imagine he did. We were present at the time when he died. Right. In the house I now. was uh, with him when he died. Yeah. Uh, Arthur was sitting in the room, and my mother-in-law was sitting in the room, and I was wiping his face with a wet cloth yeah. uh, to keep him cool. But he was out of it, I mean. Yeah, was, well, uh, and then suddenly, like, a, there was a tear that came out of his eye and down his face, and I saw that he wasn't breathing. Yeah, anymore. he let out a gasp. And I went over to Arthur, you know, and I yeah, said and that told me, uh, right. Papa's dead. And yeah. then we took Mom out of the room. Yeah. My I mother. Mean, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, we yeah. took her out of the room into the hall. Yeah. Because then the doctors came, you know, and the nurses came, and we didn't want her in the middle of everything. And then, of yeah. course, you know, we all went back again. And Harold and uh, Goldie came after he died. Yeah, right. Yeah. I remember I called up Minnie, my aunt, my father's sister. To tell her she she was like the head of our family group, yeah. the Benai Isaac family circle. So I let her know. But lost a good guy then, a good, a nice man. Oh, I'll never forget the time. I have nothing bad to say. You know, not the only one time that he ever raised his hand to me. Well, what had happened is that. Uh, a short while before this incident happened, my father was painting a house, and he was on a 40-foot ladder, and he slipped, or the ladder 
collapsed or something, and he fell to the ground, but he landed on his heels, and he broke every bone in his foot. And he was immobilized in a wheelchair for quite a while, and then he used a cane because it gave him a limp at the time. And at that time, I was going to uh, Casey Jones, a, a School, Casey of Jones School of Aeronautics in Newark, New Jersey. We lived in the Bronx, and I had to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I had to start out from my house around 6, take the train down to Wall Street area, and then take the path tubes into Newark, under the river there. What happened with your father getting upset? Well, what had happened is at that time, I had this young lady called Selma, who I was very enamored with, and I used to hang around like a love-smitten guy, you know. But wanting, I wasn't there when it happened. Uh, wanted, wanting to be, no, I was with my friends at the time. You must have been upstairs. I must have been yeah. there. Well, and my friends were there too. And uh, this was a short while before I went into Marine Corps. Anyway, I was standing there, and it must have been about 9 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, my father is across the street, and he yells, Arthur, Arthur. I said, I walked over, I said, Pop, what am I doing, uh, what are you doing here? He takes his cane and he hits me. Not very heavily, but he, he like a, a tap saying that I did wrong. On, on my buttocks or my feet or something. Because he, well, we lived a block away, down the block, and uh, um, your grandmother lived, you know, at the same house. So, anyway, that was the only time in my life I remember him. What did you do wrong? Stayed out late. Oh, you stayed he late. says you had to get, you have to get up early. Right, right. You have to go to bed. Right. You know, he was looking out for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was looking out for me. Yeah. I was oh, very right. angry with him because, first of all, if he did that frequently, I wouldn't be as angry. You used to it yeah, I, I forgave him first. Yeah. That was, uh, that's part of our genes. We forgive first. I'll never forget the time that uh, <clears throat> I was very friendly with uh, uh, your cousin Esther. Yeah. And uh, she invited me up to her house. It was a Sunday afternoon. And I went up there, and the next thing I know, Clara and Shia <laughs> were there. They came up to see me. They had never seen me. And they knew that, you know, I was his girlfriend, but he was in the Marine Corps at the time. And uh, what happened was that uh, your Aunt Minnie called up, called them up and said that Selma was going to be here. <laughs> and they sat opposite me. <laughs> your father with his hat on, <laughs> and your mother with her hat on, looking at me. <laughs> and I didn't know where to hide. <laughs> how old were you, would you say? Oh, how old was I? 16? I must have been 16. 16. I was in yeah. the Marine Corps, yeah. How old were you when you guys met each other? She was 13 and a half, and I was 15. And were you friends first before you got romantic? Well, I knew of her because what happened is all my friend boyfriends mm -hmm. hung around the candy store. Now, her father had a tailor shop, which was two doors away from the candy store. So Selma was always out front with her girlfriends. And I was with my boyfriends. And I began to notice this chubby kid with pigtails, <laughs> with that innocent look. <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> and she would be either jumping rope or uh, playing potsy, which is one of the games, right. or jacks or stuff. And I began to notice her and I began to like her from a distance. And then she would be jumping rope. And her pigtails would be jumping up and down, and she had a nice bow in it. And I would run over, and I would untie the bow, you know, give it a, 
I'd start to run, and she would run after me. After a half a block, I decided I would give up because I wanted to be caught. <laughs> then I'd walk her back, and she would go on with her friends playing what they had to. What would she do when she caught you? Nothing. I had a rope in nothing. my hands. Well, time. nothing. She would make you know, out I hit like... I with the rope. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I hit with the rope. Yeah. Yeah. She no, didn't do it hair. hard. She didn't do it hard. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I got attention from her anyway. Uh, and that was it. And then slowly it blossomed into a romance. And uh, How long until you guys, until it was obvious that, you know, there was something more than just friends? Well, uh, I would say a short while afterwards. I... Months, felt that years. you know uh, it, uh, when the, the liking persists, mm -hmm. then you know you're in love. Yeah. And Did you ever uh, think uh, it would be your wife? Uh, I anticipate, yeah. Really? I went into Marine Corps mm -hmm. with that knowledge, with that this is going to be my wife. You were going steady at that point. Uh, yeah. 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 Were you? I was. Uh, were you nervous for him going into? I was 18, and she. Very much. I was 18. She was 16 and a half. I when cried I went into so. Yeah. He left. As yeah. a matter of fact, when I used, to, I was in high school at the time, and when I used to do my homework, I had his picture in front of me, and I sobbed and sobbed so. Can I, I get up for a minute? Uh, can I get up for a minute? Yeah. I want to get home. Yeah. Um, okay. Afraid that he might get hurt in war. Of that. course, of course. Did he write you a lot of letters? Yeah, but you see. <laughs> and did you write him back? Could I have some water, please, and then I could tell you. Yes. Let me. Uh, go have you ready. You want me to show the picture on the screen? Absolutely. Okay. Tell us what we're what we're looking at here. Okay. This picture is of Selma at the age of, I would say, 16 and a half. And she was at Orchard Beach with my cousin Esther, who was a friend and a number of other Irene. girlfriends there. And I was at the beach with a couple of my friends from the block. I had just finished boot camp and I was on my first leave after boot camp at Paris Island. And that's Selma wearing my cab. It was a cold day. Yeah, and wearing my jacket. And uh, Evan had found the picture, which was a small photograph. And he blew it up, had it colored in. It was black and white. for one of my birthdays right. and they made a party and this was a prominent feature of the party, a big blow up of this picture. And uh, this is our relationship. <coughs> now you wanted to know about mail. My parents were very much against they I can put this picture down, right? I, like yeah, okay. My father was quite strict. He had three girls, and uh, he had, you know, his views of how girls should behave. And he was, you know, he was against me going with uh, Bucky. That time I called him Bucky. And uh, <clears throat> they forbid me from getting any mail from him. So he would write the letters to me and address them to Esther, and Esther would meet me and, you know, just bring the letters over to me. And that's how we communicated the entire war. Did your folks know how much you cared about my Uncle Arthur? Oh, yes, they did. But were they afraid? Yeah, were they did, young? and they were very much against it. Did they think you were just too young for that kind of a relationship? Oh, well, too young for it, and uh, I was a they bomb. thought he was a bum. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't win a mobile with his uh, personality? Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Did it take a while? Did he eventually win the mobile? Just before we were married, I, I think. I, yeah, I liked the parents, but they weren't happy campers. 
really, <laughs> really? more disciplinarian and strict. Yeah. Oh yeah, very oh, yeah. strict. And you I can't. Loose like Uncle Arthur. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, when he went on his furlough and afterwards he was going to go overseas, uh, my mother-in-law at that time she wasn't my mother-in-law, and Harold and Esther and I. Uh, went down to Grand Central to see him off. And uh, my parents were against my going, but uh, I just didn't listen to them and I went. So I want to correct there. You were about 17 at the time? I, yeah. I think I was about seven, 16 or 17, so I don't remember exactly. Yeah. And uh, I just disobeyed them and I went. And then, you know, uh, he met a number of his fellow Marines, so, you know, we said goodbye. Uh, I didn't kiss him goodbye, I was too embarrassed to. So, you know, I think we shook hands or something, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I see you again. I don't recall, really. But you had yeah. kissed each other in private. No, we didn't kiss each other. Never before, you never kissed at that oh, time? Yeah, yeah, we did, Yeah, we course. did, come on. Yeah, yeah. and uh, what we happened... back then, I don't know what <laughs> Well, what happened was that uh, Clara went my with mother. me to the store, my father's store, to kind of, you know, see pa if she could <laughs> rescue me Pass because I pipe. went against their orders. And, uh, oh, she laced into my mother, but laced into Clara, her. Really? Clara? Oh, yes. Yeah, they, 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 what did she say, like? No, she called her a stepmother, which, you know, she was. Which was not a nice thing to do. To do, and she, oh, she said terrible things to my mother. And I'm surprised my father sat there and listened to it. But I think he was afraid of her because she was a human dynamo. Oh, she was horrible. Did she love you a lot at that point? Did she really, like, uh She loved her son. And she didn't want to see her son hurt. Yeah. So she was sticking up for Arthur. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sticking up for him. See that, Uncle Arthur? And yeah. uh, Somebody then my in back parents in. called my... How would your father have handled that if he got involved, that he wouldn't get involved? Who? Oh, your, your father? Oh, he would have said something. Really? Yeah. yeah, but he he was. Uh, would he have been different about it though? Would he have said it firm? He, no, he wasn't a speaker. Sure. He was a doer, you know. Yeah. And, and he, uh, well, what happened uh, after that? My, <coughs> well, I lost my mother. Died when I was five. My natural mother. She became ill when I was four, and she was in the hospital with cancer for. Oh, I would say, you know, back and forth for a year. So I, at the age of four, I lived with my aunt on the Lower East Side and her family. And uh, then when my mother, whom I call mother because she was a true mother to me after we were married. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, she uh, what I want to say just a minute yeah well anyway she called they called my aunt Nettie whom I had lived with to see if she could straighten me out where Bucky was concerned and she came that night my aunt Nettie to the store and she was berating me and she was a religious person. I yeah, mean, and I said, I don't like care you what you young, say. You're not ready for this. You don't need this in your life right now. Is that the kind of... Well, that was, you know, I was tormented, absolutely or, uh, tormented. I'm not the guy for her. Or, you know, guy. yeah, yeah I mean, you know, uh, yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. You love Bucky at that point, though. Oh, right? yes, so very no much. <laughs> yes, very much. And Never then... Never talk someone out of being in love <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I mean, these were feelings that I had towards him. He was very good, very kind, very gentle. 
and a what good you, person to be with. What do you think it was that finally got your parents to kind of say, all right, all right, he's going to be the one? Then. Well. That took a while. That took a while, and I'll tell and you how it took. And it wasn't their decision. Took. I'll tell you how it took. <laughs> I was uh, informed that Bucky was going with another girl in Nebraska. In Nebraska? In Nebraska, where he was. May I digress? <laughs> after I went back to camp, mm -hmm. after the furlough, I was sent to radio and radar school in Omaha, Nebraska. It was a private school under go government supervision who taught 180 Marines how to repair, how to fix radios and repair radar and fix radar. And we were stationed in Nebraska, in Omaha. Now, uh, we were like men from outer space, 180 Marines in this fairly large town. And we were treated royally. Movies were free, transportation was free. Uh, we'd be welcome any place there. And uh, somehow, you know, look, you're, you're, you're men, you're young boys. You get the local girls, and you get one that you take out. Well, you know, I was only there for 12 weeks, by the way. And uh, somehow, uh, that passed. I was sent out to California. And then when I went, was out of California, I met this friend of Selma's who had moved out with her parents. What was the first name? Francine. Francine Greenberg. They changed the name to Green. Right. Greenberg. Yeah. And she moved out with her parents. She was Selma's age. Yeah. And I met her there uh, on one of the few days I was in L.A. She was in L.A. You know, and we got to talking, and, uh, you know, I said, I, I just came from Omaha, and, uh, you know, uh, the questions were there, and uh, I said I wasn't a uh, monk in Omaha. There were young girls and stuff, and uh, look, I enjoyed going out with them on my free time. And she immediately, like a yenta, like... Uh, <laughs> Wasn't okay with you, huh? uh, well, she wrote to Selma, and uh, Selma sort of started to get cold. Cold towards you? Yeah, and meanwhile, she was being fixed up by her aunt with this uh, religious guy, Mandy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, His uh, English name was and, Harry. Harry, you called him Mandy? Yeah, that's what everybody called him. Okay. I had no idea of it. I was never uh, told about it, but what happened is, while I was overseas, the letters start to become few and far between. And I began to think that uh, nothing is the uh, way it appears to be. But nothing I could do about it. I was, what, 8,000, 10,000 miles away from this little stinking island called Saipan. So uh, that was it. I still had a picture, and I, she stopped writing. I stopped writing. And that was it. And uh, look, my love for her didn't diminish. And uh, when we came back, <laughs> You know, he came back, I found out, you know, the story. He's going out with this guy, Mendy, and it looks pretty serious. And look, uh, about wild oats was sown. I figured I'd... Uh, so you went over and beat up Mendy? <laughs> no. No, no. Look, uh, I like my, I'm like my father. Live and let live. If she's going to be happy with him, let her be happy. Yeah. Uh, I'll make another life, that's all. And uh, it so happened but that... But then, uh, <clears throat> after I had been going with him for a while, and it was quite serious, uh, I happened to see Bucky. He came around the neighborhood, and I realized that I still cared very much for him. And... Uh, 
I had what you would call a slight nervous breakdown. Because of the situation? Because of the situation. And I quit my job. I had been working. I quit my job. Were you just very confused about what to do? What to do, right. And uh, my brother-in-law, my mother rather, spoke to my brother-in-law and said that I was very sad and she just didn't know what to do with me. So he went over to Bucky when he came around the block and he said, are you still interested in seeing Selma? And Bucky said, yes. He says, I'm going to go to the movies with my wife and you'll come up because she'll be babysitting. She had a one or two year old baby uh, uh, nephew. So uh, that was it. So I came he up, came up and walked uh, one flight, rang the bell, and there's Selma, and that was it. Selma what? Well, he rang the bell. I opened the door. I was very surprised to see yeah, him. Yeah, you're right. But I was very happy to see him. Yeah, because she didn't know. Uh, How did you get rid of Bendy then? I broke off with him. Should have kept the ring. <laughs> I gave it to my niece Debbie. Yeah. It wasn't a big ring. It wasn't a diamond it was, ring. It, it was no, a well, ring. Well, what's the difference? Uncle Arthur still remembers. Uh, what's, a, what's the difference? So Uncle Arthur, were you, uh, were you thinking you lost her and then were you excited oh, to get yeah. her back? Oh, yes, very. And then we started to see each other again. Yeah. And we decided to get married. Yeah, six months later, you know, we got engaged. Did your parents get along well enough at the wedding? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. At that point. Was yeah. At that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, a year after we were married, her father died. Okay. And, uh, you know, couldn't really come together in that but one year period. But when my father period. had the heart attack, uh, your dad came up to visit He came him up. He to didn't come up to visit. House. He made arrangements. Well, that, no, I'm talking about before he died. Oh, before he died, yeah. yeah I came yeah. up to visit him. And my father said to your father that you're a good boy. All right, we have 30 minutes left on this tape. And there are two things I'm thinking about right now. What? I'm thinking about a couple more things about my parents. Uh-huh. We'll figure out something. And the second thing is I wanted to talk a little bit about, if it's okay with you, on tape, a little bit about when you were stationed uh, off the coast of uh, Japan in the atomic bomb. Okay, what do you want to do first? We want to talk about uh, Steffi and Ron. Yeah, and let's, let's do it this way. This is a little different, but really talk to them as if they're going to see it. Right. Uh, don't talk about it in the third person, you know. Yeah. They're really going to watch this at some point over later in the summer. I'm going to make a longer video and okay. it'll be a nice memory. All right, talk to them. Well, uh, Steffi, uh, I want to say that you have a sense of humor that is second to none, even, even better than Mel Brooks. And you're the life of the party. We love you. I remember when you were an infant, a little girl, a beautiful young lady, and now a grandmother, a beauty a mother, a beautiful grandchildren. You should live and be happy with Ron as long as Selma and I have been. And longer. What? And longer. And longer. And longer and enjoy life the way we have. Good. Someone you want to say a little message directly to them? Steffi, please forgiving me, forgive me for making you clean up your room and rock away and wash the bathroom floor. I just wanted, you know, to get you to start doing things, to have some responsibility. Because I did the bathroom floor after you did. You didn't do a very good job. <laughs> but at least you had responsibility. <laughs> and I'll never forget those 
of what did I have with them? Oh, the, uh... What? The ice cream, uh... Sundays? The ice cream, yeah. The Sundays that we had together. God bless you and Ron, and I wish you a long, long life of happiness, which you've had now, and just enjoy your children, your grandchildren, and be happy, the two of you. And just in case I do something a little bit dramatic, can you guys just give like a wave to the camera? <laughs> that was awesome. That was really good. You set that up great. I thought like you were going to have some apology or maybe you cursed at my mom or something. Oh, no. Okay. Are you okay talking a little bit about the war? Yeah, why not? If it gets too much, just uh, give me no. a listen or something. No, no. Okay, not... could I have a water, please? Yeah. Even, I remember you guys from, I don't know, three or four years old, as soon as I had memories. Right. Yeah. And you were both so sweet. And I really remember, you were both very gentle and very warm and always very positive. And uh, I have really good memories of you guys. Oh, thank you. And, thank um, you. I remember once we were at your house, and I don't know what you did, but you broke either your arm or your foot. I'm you know, Grandma Clara to know about it. Do you remember so, that? I, I don't remember that. I know I didn't break any bones, but yeah. maybe I hurt myself. I don't know, but you you came back at a you kiss. Sure it was one of I his don't brothers? remember. Was you sure it wasn't? Hmm? Could have been the brother. Was it Noel or Andy? No, it was you. Think? It was really? definitely you. Was I really young? Yeah. It might be before I remember. I think you were playing ball with them or doing something. I know I knocked my front teeth out in the uh, in the driveway. Uh, that could have maybe out. no, but you would have a cast on your mouth. Cast on, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, First, I want to say one thing. That Noel was a lousy trumpet player. You nice. didn't know that Noel took up trumpet in school? I, um, I remember him playing trumpet. <laughs> oh, is he a lousy Did trumpet? Did he play for you? What? Uh, we heard him. <laughs> Unfortunately, you heard him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you. still like music. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So getting to World War II, first of all, can you tell us why did you enlist? Well, for two things, the grand and glory of the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, I'm saying that facetiously. Um, I was a kid who was 17 and a half. Uh, there was a draft going on for 18-year-olds and older, where Uncle Sam took you whether you wanted to go or not. I was younger, so I could make up my mind as to what service I can choose, whether the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard. And I figured if I pass the physical for the Marine Corps, I would take that first. If I failed, then I would go to one of the other services. This way I had my choice and not having to wait till 18. I was at that time a little over 17 and a half. So I enlisted, I passed the physical, and I went to boot camp, camp in uh, Paris Island. And then after my boot camp, went up to Camp Lejeune. Uh, and from Camp Lejeune, a couple of months, I went to Omaha, Nebraska for radio school. Uh, and then from there, uh, we went to Camp Pendleton. Well, actually, we went to Camp Elliott, which was just outside of Los Angeles, which no longer exists. Uh, we then transferred to Camp Pendleton, which was a very big base near San Diego, which I think uh, our friend here, our interlocutor, knows very much of. At that time, it was a uh, 
dinky military town, Navy base. Uh, and you were 17 at that time? I was 18 at the time. Did you have I, any trepidation about signing up for the, to go into war and knowing that, of course, it's possible that something could happen to you and you might not come back? No, that was in the back of my mind, but it wasn't predominant. What was predominant is that I got out of a little a cloistered area in the Bronx where my big trips were downtown uh, or, you know, uh, it, was, it was limited. So you were so ready for some adventure? I, you know, I always wanted to go out on my own. Were your parents supportive? Uh, they knew I would be taken anyway. So this way I had the choice and apparently uh, they were quite liberal in letting me say what I wanted to do. And I told them, look, I said, look, I will be call being called up. My brother was with me at the time. Harold. Yeah, Harold. And uh, uh, he spoke with them and he said, look, he'll be called up at 18. And this way he can, if he passes the physical, he'd be able to go into the Marine Corps, which he likes to, to, like to enlist in. Did Harold have to go? Harold was caught up in the peacetime draft. We had a peacetime draft in 1939, 1940. 1940. This was uh, more or less of an anticipation of uh, hostilities with Japan or Germany. Germany has already raised their heads. And in September of 41, they started, in September of 40, no, 39, they started war with England. So it was more or less uh, a peacetime draft after Hitler started to invade all these countries in Europe, about 39, 40. And my brother was called up. It was a draft similar to the Vietnamese draft where they would call your number out. If you had a low number, you'd go. If you had a high number, you would. And they had their various classifications, uh, married with children. So did, uh, he, did he actually get He was single. Uh, he wasn't married yet. He hadn't met Joan yet, his wife. And he went for a physical. And at that time, uh, they were a lot more picky because we weren't at war. They didn't need the manpower at the time. And they found a murmur, uh, what they call a murmur, uh, a regular heartbeat. Oh, you saw it, yeah. So he was, uh, he was athletic. He, he was a bike rider and he played ball. And uh, he was really in good condition. And he felt it really dropped him down. Went to our local physician and uh, he checked him out. And he says, you have a slight murmur. He says, it won't affect you. You're going to live to a ripe old age. Unfortunately, he didn't. But he says, you'll probably live to a ripe old age. He says, be grateful that you're not in the midst of this war preparation right now. He says, most probably, if they do need you, they'll take you. He says, well, meanwhile, rest easy, knowing that you're as healthy as anybody else. Was he upset that he wasn't going to go? Oh, uh, sort of. I don't think uh, really upset because he was still in his uh, upper, let's see, uh, 1940. Uh, he must have been in his 20s, early 20s. Uh, this way he was still young. He's still enjoying life. Okay, so uh, so, uh, so he you didn't. Get drafted. I mean, you didn't get drafted. You signed up. Uh, on I signed up, yeah. I remember going. When did you get put on to uh, Saipan? Okay, what had happened is that, uh, as we said, went to Camp Pendleton. Uh, we were there maybe a short while. 1940 uh, this is about? Uh, no, this is 19, uh, let's see, 42, 43. Oh, so this is well after Pearl Harbor. Yeah, 41. Uh, let's see, I was at 41. I was born in 24, so 34, 10, 44, 
is 20. So I must have been about, at Pearl Harbor, about 16 and a half at that time. So when I enlisted, I was uh, 17 and a half. And uh, what had happened is the invasions had already, uh, the island hopping has already uh, happened. Wake Island, uh, Kwajalein, Aniwetok, all these little islands out in the Pacific. Uh, we had to protect Hawaii, which was very vulnerable because Japan took over Hong Kong, Shanghai, the Philippines, uh, uh, Port Moresby, New Guinea. Uh, they were advancing on Australia. You were on so anyway, so I was on the West Coast. And uh, one day we got our orders. I must have been at Camp Pendleton for maybe three or four weeks at the most, fighting brush fires up in the hills. And we uh, told her to pack up our duffel bags and to get ready to shove out. And we had no orders or anything uh, told us, which they generally didn't do until you were on board with a ship or wherever you were going. And I remember uh, the, from Camp Pendleton, we got on trucks and we went down to the Navy base, I believe at Point Loma. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I remember this was towards evening and we were walking across submarines that were parked, maybe five or 10 of them that were parked one against another. And they had a catwalk walking there. And on the end of it was a destroyer that was just out of shakedown cruise. Now, shakedown cruise is where they test out all the stuff on a destroyer, as you would do when you get into a new car and you, you get the high five and the navigation and everything. This is the shakedown cruise. They had a green crew on board. They had come from uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard with a... But could you take me back to the chair? So we're moving it. Should we move right ahead to that aircraft? Yeah, okay. So uh, after uh, uh, getting on this destroyer, uh, we uh, were under forced orders to travel as fast as possible to Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. We were escorting a baby flat top, which was a uh, uh, transporting some planes to Hickam Field in Hawaii. And we made... Um, Hawaii in three days on board the destroyer and uh, from Hawaii, uh, from uh, Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, we went over to the Big Island of Hawaii where I joined up with the 2nd Marine Division. And from that base, uh, we uh, got on board ships at Hilo, Hawaii and uh, we started to go towards our invasion point, which was Saipan. And uh, we were supposed to go into Saipan the same day as D-Day in Europe. However, there was some uh, logistics that they couldn't meet. And so we went in on the 15th of June. Uh, we were on... Nin no, 1944. 1944 was D-Day, June 6th. This was June 15th, 1944. We went into Saipan. Uh, we took Saipan in uh, one month, which actually took as a relatively uh, uh, broad statement because they were still on the island and they were still hiding in caves and occasionally they would come out as individual groups uh, to harass us. But anyway, uh, we were there. We finally uh, neutralized the island, and we were on there uh, until uh, May 1st of 1945. Let's see, June 1945. April, no, April 1st, we went into Okinawa as the versionary troops. And uh, we were only there for about two weeks. And then we came back to Saipan. Did you personally see fighting? 
Uh, yeah, I saw fighting on Saipan. I was, Sai Pen, I was at D Day. And uh, saw fighting there, uh, saw fighting on Tinian, which was a, a sister island to Saipan, which was only separated by a strait of maybe uh, five miles. Were you fighting yourself, or were you doing stuff with fixing radios? No, well, I carried a rifle with me, and uh, they were firing at me, and uh, I didn't have any real targets to shoot at. Uh, if I fired my gun twice, it was a lot. But uh, I, I needed something, a uh, target. I wasn't going to do uh, shoot wildly. But most of the time, I was not, I was in the front, but in back of the front. In other words, we were the, it was headquarters company. That's where the generals and the logistics came from, which they were behind the fighting forces themselves. But we were always within a bullet, and on an island that was only five miles by 12 miles, a bullet can travel awfully far, you know, across that distance. Anyway, uh, we finally secured that island and the island of Tinian. Now, the island of Tinian, they immediately, the CBs immediately took over. CBs were the construction unit of the Navy. They took over and they made a runway that was approximately, I think, offhand at least 11 miles long. It was a flat island and they were able to do that. What they did is they brought in the B-29s for the first time. And they used to reconnoiter uh, above us at all, you know, on Saipan. They were just a hop, skip, and a jump. And what happened is that uh, one day uh, in August of 1945, uh, they had already surrendered in, on ETO, the European Theater of Operations, but the Japanese were still fighting. And the B-29s firebombed Tokyo, quite a few cities, and they didn't want to give up surrender. So what they had to use was the atomic bomb. We first heard of it by uh, mimeograph sheets that would be we would get the news from the ships offshore, and it would be sent onto the land, onto uh, uh, Saipan, and it would be typed up in, uh, on a mimeograph sheet, and we would get like a uh, newspaper bulletin telling us that the bomb landed on Nagasaki, on um, Hiroshima, and that Scientists say we won't be able to go into that area for 20 years because of radioactivity. Did you have any idea what this bomb was all about? Uh, not really. Not really. Were you surprised at how big it was and how? Uh, well, well, no, not well. I didn't know dimensions or anything. I, when they said 20,000 tons of TNT. I mean, you say 20 kilos, it doesn't register. When you say 20,000 pounds, you start to figure, and you divide by 2,000, and you get, get the tonnage, so you know how big it was. Did and you see a flash, or did you hear anything? No, well, no, we didn't see anything there. We were, we were a good, uh, I would say, maybe uh, 900,000 uh, miles away. Maybe how many, how about miles? seven, well, let's see, 750. I would say between 750 and 1,000 miles away okay. from the Japanese islands. Okay. And this was the island of uh, Kuril. That was the lower island of, um, okay. of the Japanese. Oh, we have eight minutes left. Okay. <laughs> uh, eight minutes is more than enough. Anyway, what had happened is that uh, when they said you couldn't go in there for 20 years, uh, we were saying, okay, we won't be going near that island anymore. And um, then a few days later, the uh, edition of the paper came back and said the scientists had investigated the radiation and found out it was just contained in a local area and uh, it should be dissipating in a very short while. This was in August. And then, three days later, the other bomb landed on Nagasaki. 
Uh, Nagasaki was a big industrial town. Mitsubishi had, built, had their submarine building capacities and shipbuilding capacities there. Big industrial town. It also had uh, prison of war camps. And it had a fairly large Catholic population due to the Portuguese uh, missionaries that had come there. Uh, we got noticed to pack up and we were given, at that time we moved from, um, from our base, we moved down towards uh, the debarkation area and we got on board ships. We weren't told where we were going until we were on board the ship. When we were on board the ship, they told us we were going to Nagasaki. But at that time, the Japanese had sued for peace and they had signed a treaty on board the Missouri with MacArthur. And uh, this was three weeks after that. We sailed into Nagasaki Harbor. The bomb yeah. We sailed into Nagasaki and we saw what we would have been up against if we went there as fighting troops. We would have had casualties galore, all cliffs, rough areas to get into, but we went in there as peacekeeping occupation troops. We landed there and the devastation was horrible, especially towards the center of town. And there were mass graves. There were graves being dug where people were dying, more or less like flies from radiation sickness. Were you prepared for any of this? Uh, not to that extent. Of course, I saw mass killings on Saipan by troops, you know, killing Banzai attack Japanese who would be running at them. Uh, uh, they were quite... A lot of them were drunk. They would drink beer, and then they would get their courage up, yell Banzai, and come into our field of fire and be killed. I saw that on Saipan. But when I saw children and women with these horrible radiation burns and blisters and swollen limbs and uh, the patterns of kimonos burnt into their skin by the... Uh, flash of the burst and stuff that made me a little a little a lot more passive, more peace loving than I was before how man can do this to man and uh, it was a, a big awakening I think I became more of an adult and less of a young kid looking for thrills then and there and uh, then I was there, we were there, and I, we were near Ground Zero. In fact, I did walk in Ground Zero a number of times. Our shop was only about a half a mile away. What did it look like there? Uh, devastation. You had, um, excuse me, most of the buildings were little squares of wood, metal, uh, with up furniture, stuff like that, but raised to the ground except for a few uh, steel reinforced concrete buildings. They were able to be flexible enough where the concrete would crack off, but it would hold some of the remnants of the building in place. But most of it was devastated in an area, I would say, at least a half a mile wide there. The town hall, half of it was destroyed, the other half was tilting over, and that was a stone building, I believe, there. But we, uh, where we lived, we got very, um, uh, we got acquainted with the families that lived outside of our compound, which used to be the Japanese Army Prefecture Headquarters. Were you there to help uh, in a humanitarian? Uh, well, in a, in a way. In a way, what happened is that uh, Japanese officers lived in this compound. So they had these, uh, <coughs> these mats that they slept on, which we didn't sleep on. We slept on 
bunks. And uh, what we did is we went to the wall and we gave these people that lived around the enclosure the stuff there, the pickled foods, and then we were told not to eat those foods because they use human excrement for fertilizer. So all our food had to come from our commissary and stuff. Yeah, so anyway, we gave them their food. We made friends with them. And uh, uh, I was very helpful to them, gave them a lot of furniture and stuff. And one family decided that they liked me, and they liked me as a son-in-law for their daughter. <laughs> really? So they more or less offered it to be, well, that's what I understood, but uh, I wasn't biting on that. But anyway, they invited me over and with some of the food that I had given them, and they broke bread with me, and I drank sake, and it was like a... Really? Uh, so you got to know them a little bit. Yeah, got to know them. Got to play with the kids. And they used to play with bean bags with their toys. And uh, got to know them and spoke a few words of Japanese, not very much. And uh, after about five months in Japan, six months, we went back to the States. And I remember we went on a ship. And we came into your grand and glorious San Diego. And from there, I went on to an Army troop train what we call an army pullman, and traveled cross country into uh, Bainbridge, Maryland, where I was discharged in Bainbridge, Maryland. Was your family there to see you, or did you take no, a train no. to see them? Or? No, they, they, how many more minutes do you have? One, one and a half. Okay, I came into Bainbridge, Maryland, and after two days I was discharged, and we took our train into Pennsylvania Station. From there I hopped on to the uh, number six train, the Hunts Point train. And I got off not far from my folks' home. It was a cold day. And I finally got a taxi to take me to my house. And when I came over to Longfellow Avenue, my brother was waiting. Your grandfather was waiting. They came out. They hugged me. My mother was what they call chalishing, fainting. <laughs> my father was his beautiful self. And that was it. Did it feel good to be home after all that time? Yes. Very good after that time. I had my taste of the military. They offered me. They said, you can make sergeant. I was a corporal at the time. You can make sergeant. You can make a career out of Marine Corps. We need men like you. I said, no, I've had it. Yeah. They wanted me. Uh, the police force wanted me yeah. in New York. I should have joined, but I didn't. I said, uh, no, nothing military for me, right. or quasi-military. You had your fill. I had my fill. Yeah. And had you talked much about the war after, or not too much? Uh, not too much. I remember I was trying to eat a half a grapefruit the, the night I came home, and your grandfather was sitting across the table. Mm. It took me about an hour and a half to eat the grapefruit. He was questioning me so. <laughs> was it more than you wanted to answer at that point? Not more than I wanted, but I was hungry. <laughs> hungry. That was more important than tomorrow. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we have a wonderful family. It was a good life. It still is a good life. And uh, that's it. Thank you all for watching. And I want you to know that the interviewer has been very pleasant, very professional. Thank you. And we love you, Stefan. I love you, too. Okay. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good job. One of Steffi's boys. <laughs>